online um, um, and listening and under my voice, we thank you, Lord, that we are going to sow seeds uh, that will that will come to fruition. We thank you, Lord, for our main speaker today, and we thank you, Lord, that he is he is blessed. His words are your words, and that his words will transform us um, forever. We thank you, Lord, for this meeting, and we declare this meeting um, to be in your presence. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Right, a few things about us. Um, we, are, we are the Christian Man's Ministry, which is an um, interdenominational men's ministry um, whose vision is to disciple men um, using b- biblical truth and uh, truths and principles. Um, and one of our goals uh, is to create a network of men who can coach and mentor each other to fulfilling our mandate as priests in, the, in our households and as godly leaders and servants in our churches and workplaces. We discuss all our experiences within our homes and the, within the marketplace, and we use the unchanging truths from the Bible to challenge and hold each other accountable. That's a little bit of who we are and what we do. And um, I don't know for those who are going to join us. And and yes, we um, we know that men are in the in biblical times. Men are, is everyone from from 12 years old. So please, we encourage you, men, to bring your your 12 year olds, your 13 year olds, your 15 year olds, your 20 year olds, uh, your 50 year olds uh, to this meeting. Um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce um, our speaker uh, for today. He is not new to our platform, he's a dear friend of, um, of ours in this platform. Um, we are going to have um, Dr. Farai talk to us about uh, men's health. Um, the little brief that I have on Dr. Fry, you know, you, you cannot be described or introduced in a in a paragraph. Uh, but what I have here is that he is he's a husband, he's a father, he's a physician, he's a cardiologist, and he is a public health consultant. He is the founder of um, of Santon Here Inc., which provides clinical services in hospitals in Santon area. He also does academic outreach to some training hospitals in South Africa and in Zimbabwe. And he is an executive member of the African Society of Cardiovascular um, Intervention. So, Dr. Farai, a warm welcome to you. And uh, looking forward to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, my brother, for that kind introduction. And can you guys hear me? The guys online, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. <laughs> okay, fantastic. No, thank you. So this is not the first time that we are talking about men's issues. And um, I had initially prepared the presentation. Then something happened last night. Besides the fact that I was working until very late, we... I got a message from my son, who is 12 years of age. He sent me a video clip of a clinical conversation in America where there was a family that lost their loved one. And so the family is gathered around, everyone is sad, they are mourning and so on. And then there is a medical practitioner with an administrator who are coming in and saying to them, is it going to be cash or card? You see? And, uh, you know, these people are obviously very distraught. And someone is walking into the room and demanding payment for services rendered, so to say. And that is a conversation that happens a lot of times in our day-to-day, you know, living. I've had in encounters with some of you with similar, you know, experiences where a loved one falls ill, we take them to hospital. The first thing you are given is a quotation that says, for you to, to walk into this facility, you need to spend so much, you know? And as a man, the responsibility what falls upon you, isn't it? You are, you know, probably 
the parent, the brother, and so on. And uh, everyone else is, you know, worried about the illness. You are, you are at the back of your mind, you are worried about the finances. Am I going to afford to keep this individual in this hospital or in this facility and so on? And that is one of the lessons that we've, we've, we've learned even during COVID. You know, during the COVID pandemic, as societies, we had to reorganize ourselves, you know. We come from an environment where a lot of us are living in countries or in communities where when people fall sick, they will not use the local facilities, you know. Those who have money would, you know, catch a flight and they fly to Dubai, America, and so on. They get so sorted and they come back. When COVID hit, no one could travel. And all of a sudden we realized we haven't been investing in our own local infrastructure. We haven't been investing in our own, you know, people to provide these services. And what happened? I know cases where buildings were being, you know, refurbished and made into wards. And uh, there were makeshift, you know, clinics, you know, coming up everywhere. And uh, this conversation, I think, comes down to even households where as men, as leaders in our own households, you know, these are, co these are conversations that we have to have where we say to ourselves, and as far as my family is concerned, how am I going to take care, care of them? going forward. And if you look at what is happening in South Africa right now, we are re-engineering the way we provide healthcare services to the population. There is this whole talk about NHI, National Health Insurance, and the question is, how is it going to affect you and your household? Currently, we have multiple... Thank you. Currently, we, ha we have multiple health service, you know, providers who will provide a service to you on a fee for, you know, I mean, on a fee for, you know, for service type of environment. And your fundings might be out of pocket or it comes from a medical aid provider out there. And uh, already, those who've got medical aids will tell you that by the time the year comes to about June, July, you've, you've run out of benefits. You know? You've run out of benefits. And if anyone falls, falls ill, as a man, you have to make a plan. As a man, you have to make sure that it's not only yourself, but your family is healthy. And I know, you know, Patients of mine who will come to me towards the end of the year and they say to me, doctor, I know I need to have one, two, three, four done, but I don't have the benefits. Can we delay this procedure until the next year when my benefits, you know, kick in? And then you say to them, but, you know, by us delaying this procedure, we run the risk of you complicating in this manner and that manner, you know. And I think this is a this is a con this is a difficult conversation that we have to have as men. I know no, normally when we have these sessions, it ends up being about uh, you know your own personal health, you know, in a way. It ends up being about, for a lot of the young men, it's about, uh, you know, ED or erectile, you know, dysfunction at the end of the day. But I think this is a very important, you know, <laughs> conversation that as men we need to uh, have to confront with because a lot of times, you know, I've seen people who have a lot of money, they run into trouble, they, and they don't access the health services that they deserve because they haven't planned well for their, you know, for, for themselves and their families. You have a 
a situation where there is a medical emergency in the middle of the night. You run into one of these private hospitals. They say to you, we, we need a deposit of 200,000 rand, for example. And 200,000 rand for some of these individuals that I have met is nothing. But to get 200,000 rand cash or to do a swipe or a transfer in the middle of the night, you know, and the person who can only do that transaction is the very person who is very ill. Then people have to run around them to, you know, to try and come up with those resources and uh, time and money is wasted. I, 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 I mean, time and opportunity is wasted for us to do something tangible on time. So what am I saying, you know, by, by bringing up all of these uh, um, you know, situations. What I'm saying is that in some communities, which I think the Christian community, you know, can, you know, can do a lot, a lot more, we have found out that in some communities, they also have their own health care service, you know, funding me me mechanisms. I know guys in the insurance sectors, you know, will, you know, will tell you that they have been approached by certain, you know, other religious communities to have their own, you know, different funding mechanisms which support their members when times like this arise. I know that uh, in some communities during the COVID, you know, uh, uh, situation that we, we had, there was a crisis in in this country where there was no oxygen. <clears throat> For example, we ran out of oxygen, we ran out of certain medications, but there were individuals in certain communities who would say to you, Doc, what do I need? Okay, I need oxygen. Okay, don't worry, I'll get oxygen. What else do I need? And you say you need this specific drug, but we don't have it here. Don't worry, I will get that medication elsewhere. And they also managed to organize themselves in such a manner that even those individuals who were not hospitalized, who were not put into these institutions, there was regular contact with either be it a paramedic, a nurse practitioner, or anyone, you know, who had some sort of... Uh, healthcare expertise that could then feed back to a group of, you know, doctors or specialists who were advising individuals to say, no, 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 this one, I think, take him to hospital. And uh, when that decision is made within the community, the ambulance is dispatched, you know. For us, you call for an, for an ambulance, what would happen? The ambulance will take four four hours to get there. By the time the, you know you get to the to the hospital, the ambulance has to queue, and some people were dying outside hospitals during the COVID um, situation. So this is the challenge that I'm saying to you know to us guys. You know we meet here, we are all from different um, you know backgrounds, different expertise. But this is a real challenge that we have as men who want to take care of our families, take care of our communities. And uh, I know because of the caliber of guys that are here, we can get something going in as far as this is, you know, this is concerned. So the, my first issue or my first uh, pillar of this conversation is around the healthcare funding, the healthcare structure, and how can we as men, you know, who are leaders in our communities, organize ourselves to take care of not only ourselves, but those around us. Okay. And then uh, after our last conversation with, uh, I think it was Brother Sam, who raised a very important issue that, as this main ministry, we tend not to, you know, take, you know, too much care or attention when it comes to our young ones who are, you know, growing up 
you know, missed. We focus mainly on our, on our needs as men. But I wanted to break, you know, to, you know, to break my next, you know, uh, part of this discussion into two points. The first one is the young individuals or the young, you know, uh, members of our community and the elderly in our com community. We need to have, you know, different ways of approaching their care when it, when it comes to men's health is concerned. So the first thing is coming to the young ones. I see we've got some very young individuals here who are, you know, part of the group. Welcome. I want us to, you know, take this conversation in this context where the heart is, I think, the core of the, you know, the person's, you know, existence in that it is the main, you know, pump that provides energy, flow of blood to the rest of the body. And um, being a cardiologist, you know, we encounter a lot of individuals who run into trouble earlier on in their lives because of uh, uh, cardiovascular diseases. And majority of us will die from a cardiovascular event anyway, here. Majority of us will die because of something that has happened to the function of the heart. But the heart itself is basically a muscle, which has got energy that regulates it, but it is also influenced <coughs> by everything else around it. When I say everything else around it, it means all the other organs and even the emotional state of the individual. And the good thing is that when someone is born, you know, we have all of these scores that, uh, you know, the medical community has come up with, you know, a like uh, the APCA score. The midwives would say, no, this one had a low APCA, this one had a high APCA. And the moment you say low APCA, the care pathway becomes, you know, uh, different. And there are certain expectations when someone has had a low APCA score where we say this one might end up in a neonatal, you know, intensive care environment. The baby who's had a very good APCA score may be discharged the following day and life goes on. Okay. But the fact that someone has had a relatively low score means that when they enter that care pathway, people are very critical of certain aspects of their well-being. And fortunately, we have a very good, you know, primary health care setting in most of our communities where the babies will be examined, you know, just after birth, they go for immunizations, there's constant examinations, you know. They enter school, before you enter school, you are examined, you know? And they'll say, no, this one is, uh, you know, has got problems in this area and that area, so we need to have this intervention in place. And by the time you leave school, you've probably had some of your main um, um, conditions identified and there are systems in place to take care of that individual. And for a lot of our boys, unfortunately or fortunately, what happens is when they now get into their teenage years because of the environment that we are, we are in, there are a lot of pressures for the boys, be it from a sporting perspective, also from an image you know, perspective, and uh, a lot of them, you know, end up engaging in some high risk, I would say high risk behaviors where, for example, I have a 12 year old whom every time we get into the car and we are driving, you know, as, as soon as we drive past the shop, dad, can I have prime? Dad, can I have, <laughs> dad, can I have this, you know? And these are energy drinks. You see? 
And you say to yourself, but what is fueling this in this, gen in this generation that they so much want to have so much energy? And also on the, on the sporting field, he plays a lot of basketball, you know, and he's even now taken, you know, boxing and he's so, he's, he's 12. And he's so aware of his, you know, his strength, I can jump so high, and so on. And um, unfortunately, sometimes in the school environment, you then get coaches and schools that will identify the talent in these individuals, and they will push them very hard. And some of them end up in our, concert, you know, in our rooms where now the child is running into trouble, you know, for various reasons. For, for, for example, re recently we had a child who was playing ten tennis, you know, provincially in, uh, in uh, Johannesburg. And uh, he started running into trouble because the coaches were pushing him. Even when the, when the weather is cold, this kid, no, I, 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 you know, I need to go and train. I need to become the best, you know, in my game. But that child, unfortunately, ended up having a heart transplant at some stage. Because all of a sudden, they went to some tournament, he realized he was not performing at his best. Ended up seeing some of my colleagues, and they realized, no, this child has had an infection. And most likely, it was one of these viral infections which weakened his heart and um, ended up in hospital a couple of months and uh, had a heart transplant. But he was very fortunate to have a heart transplant. In fact, after that tra transplant, a year after that transplant, he went on to represent you know, South Africa in the transplant games and won some medals and so on. So this is a child who, you know, had that illness identified quite early, and there was a, an opportunity for us to intervene as healthcare professionals. Now, the question is, how many of us out there, you know, have got young kids like this, you know, who are participating in sport, who are being pushed, and how many of them have had a general, you know, physical examination of some sort, or some screening of some sort. And yet you will find a lot of that screening is so easy to do where in some families, people sit down and they say, oh, so-and-so died from cancer. So-and-so died from a heart attack, you know? Or so-and-so, you know, just collapsed and died. And that becomes the end of the conversation. But the next part of that conversation should, 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 should be, what does this mean for me right now? That 14-year-old who ended up getting a transplant is, um, when you now look back, you then realize that there was something that was happening in that family. There was some, you know, there was something that is in that cohort of, of genes, you know, which people can always look look back and screen these young screen these youngsters for some of these conditions. I had at some stage uh, one of the parents in in the school where my kids go to up. You know, he approached me and he said, "You know what? I've got this family that I'm worried about." They've had issues where so many individuals have died, and I'm worried about a congenital or a genetic uh, rhythm issue because people just collapse and die. And then the next question I asked them, so have they been screened? And then it was comforting to know that at least someone was, you know, taking the trouble to, you know, to screen these, you know, those those kids from that family. And fortunately for some of these things, there are interventions that can be put in place for them, where if we identify that they are at high risk of, you know, collapsing suddenly on the fields, 
they are kids that have, you know, collapsed playing, playing sport. Okay. And then when we move up now to the end of life care, we are faced as men a lot of times with situations where when you are at your prime, you know, intellectually, your career is doing very well, the community industry will take very good care of you. Okay? And a lot of guys think that, you know, it's, it's about me. And the fact of the matter is that it's not about you. It's about the industry taking care of their interests. And why, and why do I say that? The guys who work for the insurances would, would, would tell you that they've got certain criteria that if you exceed a certain threshold in terms of your weight, your um, level of cholesterol, and so on, or anything, if they pick up anything, even in your family, that your brother died suddenly, then they will say to you, we will you know, insure you, we'll cover you, but at a premium. So they are taking care of their in they are taking care of their interests. If you become a big, you know, executive in uh, these firms, it is mandatory that before we, you know, we, we we make you sign that piece of paper that we are appointing you to, to this position, you must go and visit Dr. So and so to run a couple of tests. And you must pass certain thresholds. And when you pass those thresholds, we must make sure that you maintain that state of health. The moment you start running into trouble, people start having difficult conversations. You know, so we start getting difficult requests. You know, can you predict? you know, that this event is going to occur again, I'll, I'll give you a, you know, a simple example. I recently had a very young man who works for one of these, um, you know, ships out there. Very, very talented individual who unfortunately had a heart attack and was evacuated into, they were out at sea, ended up being evacuated into one of these countries in America. They sorted him out, and then they put him on a plane and they brought him back to South Africa. They said to him, go and recover, go and sort yourself out. When you are ready, come back. But when you are ready means you must pass certain, you know, tests. And at the end of it all, they then say to you, what is, Dr. Dube, can you predict if this event is going to happen again? And unfortunately, with some of these things, with what's happening in the world right now, it's very difficult to predict. So they make it the medical fraternity's problem that, no, 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 you haven't passed because we want you to you know, to have a threshold of less than, you know, 2% probability that this event is going to happen again. So what, what that means is, is, you know, essentially is that that individual's career is, you know, is gone. We've had situations where someone gets the heart attack, you sort them out, but because of the nature of their job, you know, sometimes it can be someone who drives, you know, public transport or someone who flies aeroplanes and so on. For them to get back into that career, they need to pass, you know, certain tests. Because at the end of the day, if they are not taking care of themselves and they have a similar event whilst they are, you know, carrying people or whatever, that can be catastrophic. So during you know, your, your working career, 
the corporates will say to you, you every year, you know, as a as a director in this organization, you must go for these tests. You must so the guys who are <coughs> in those positions are taken care of. Okay. They will come every year. Dr. Dube, I've come for my annual one, two, three, four, five. Everything is fine, Baba. Go. Yeah. When you when they start running into trouble, somehow the organization will find out that no, 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 no. This guy is not performing at his best. What is going on here? You know? And they'll come to you. I mean, to, to us who say, ah, we are identifying, you, you need to address these issues. And they will and we'll give you an opportunity to address these, these issues. And if you fail to address these health is issues, then the corporate will now start saying to you, can you give us a report? You know, it means they're starting to manage this individual out of the, the system. And uh, the moment you, we finish some of those rep reports and you say, no, he's been, you know, fine. This happened. Now he's struggling because of one, two, three, we've tried to rehabilitate and so on. It means that individual is out. And the moment they are out of that environment, a lot of guys run into trouble, become very depressed. And it's normally downhill thereafter. Even if their benefits are also not as much, you know, as before. And you and you see guys who then run into pro problems to an extent where, by the time they are at at the end of their lives, that is the most expensive part of their existence. In that. Terminal care becomes very expensive. Terminal care being, you know, when you get very ill, if you end up being in an ICU environment, if you end up needing a lot of rehabilitation and so on, it becomes very expensive. And part of the funding of some of that care now comes from what the insurance guys, you know, will provide benefits for. You know, when you are temporarily incapacitated, there are funding mechanisms to, you know, to cover for, for that. If you are a key man in any organization, if you run into trouble, there are, you know, funding mechanisms to, you know, to, to cover you for, for, for that. And when you need, you know, rehabilitation for a long period of time and you're not making an income as well, they are funding, you know, mechanisms to, you know, to provide for that. So these are conversations that a lot of us have to have right now whilst we're still strong, you know, whilst we're still employed, whilst we're still working, to try and make sure that we, 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 we cater for that part of our life. And a lot of guys run into trouble there. You know, I've had situations where there yeah, are guys who drive Rolls Royces. Eh? They will come in their Rolls Royce to the hospital and they run into trouble and someone ends up in hospital for six months and everything around them collapses. And you can tell this guy is stressed because things are not happening out there. But I'm saying, to, no, 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 no. You have to stay here because we need to take care of one, two, three, four, five issues. And the life collapses around them. And also, those that are at the very end of their life, where you find that the prognosis is very poor, um, their decisions have to be made where do we, you know, Continue, you know, continuously intervene in this situation, or do we allow the individual to die peacefully with grace, you know? <clears throat> and for such situations, some, you know, some people have um, directives in place where 
someone will say, if my life, you know, gets to a stage where I need to be kept alive by machines and so on, please allow me to die peacefully. So we, we have had situations where individuals will come into a hospital very critically ill, and then the next thing you get is a note that says, you know, do not resuscitate this individual because a lot of people can lose a lot. They can use a lot of resources to keep someone alive in a situation where, unfortunately, the outcomes may be poor at the end of the day. So the last part of my conversation really now is where a lot of us guys, you know, fall in. And we've had some of these coin conversations around our well-being as, you know, guys. When I walked into here, it was so exciting to see you guys. And one comment I want to say is that, you know, a lot of us have gained a bit of weight. <laughs> 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 I hope it's a sign that you know, you know, you know, life is good out there. But we should, you know, remember the things that we've always been, you know, speaking about. That as men, we need to take care of ourselves. We need to, you know, have good habits. Okay. And what are some of those good habits? It means exercising, eating well. And dealing with, uh, you know, stress. And obviously having the regular encounters with the healthcare system at whatever level. If you get a bit of a cold, go and get it sorted. Because a lot of times, some of these colds that people are having are not just simple colds anymore. You see? And uh, exercise, exercise, exercise is something that I've always been, you know, you know, saying to the guys that we need to get active. Maybe part of our interaction should not be, you know, here where, you know, we sit, we talk, and then we walk out, we feed ourselves, and, you know, you go. Uh, part of our interaction should, should, should also be, I don't know, you know, golf, you know, guys go out and play golf, guys who, who like to play basketball, spend some time, you know, fellowshipping around, you know, some of the sporting activities. The guys who enjoy running can go out and, you know, have um, a run every, every now and again, you know, and also get to share ideas on how, um, why blessing is still looking the way it is. <laughs> and you'll be surprised what a lot of guys are doing out there in terms of, you know, taking care of themselves. It's, it's, it's not so much, uh, you know, what used to happen in the past. It was the women, you know, the women will, will go to the shopping mall and they are thinking of their diets. They will go to work. They are talking about their diets, you know, and exercise. But guys, these days, guys are also diets, you know. Guys are dieting. <laughs> guys are getting onto um, some of these programs where they are using some of these, you know, supplements, healthy supplements, okay? Some guys are going out to these uh, injectables that were uh, initially being a lot by women to take care of themselves, you see? So I think it's also about the mindset as well, you know, that the mindset is, has changed. We've, we've got a wellness um, movement out there where people are being driven towards you know, wholesome well-being, <clears throat> where it's, it's not so much about your physical well-being, but also your emotional and psychological, you know, well-being as well. So I think uh, for now, let me, let me give you guys some, you know, time for us to start interacting on some of these uh, points that I've, uh, that I've raised. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Mm. Uh, Mr. Suzuki, can I go ahead? Okay, great. Um, 
Maybe let me come closer to that side and use the mic. That would be good then. And then, maybe what I'm also just saying is that um, the guys online, you're also welcome to throw in your questions to the chat and also pick them as we, as we go. The guys in the room, uh, please indicate if you've got any questions and we, 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 we will gladly uh, take the questions. I don't know who's got the first one. Uh, Mr. Sos, go for it. Thank you so much, Doc, for an uplifting conversation and a very informative conversation. Scary, but uh, well, well, well done on that. Um, my, my, my question is based on the you know, COVID, post-COVID scenario. I think most of us were vaccinated, those, those who took heed of our doctor's instructions. But we, we keep on hearing things like, uh, you know, it's the vaccination, it's the vaccination. They did this, the CEO of... Uh, of uh, one of the vaccination companies didn't even take the vaccine and stuff like that. So, um, is there insight from your from your studies um, on on how the vaccine is impacting our cardiovascular abilities? Um, and uh, if so, is what are the possible remedies to that? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that question. I knew I knew it was coming somewhere. But <laughs> <laughs> so I think what what you must realize is that COVID is one of those diseases that accelerated the way we do things in as far as making vaccines is concerned, doing drug trials, and uh, coming up with new medications. You know. If you compare what happened during COVID and what has happened with HIV, for example, we're only talking about an HIV vaccine now, you know, and HIV has been here since when, since the early 80s. Huh? So unfortunately, because of, the, of, 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 of how aggressive and, you know, the spread was for, for COVID, there were a lot of technologies that were deployed, which a lot of us in the medical fraternity were not very comfortable with the pace at which the deployment was done. And uh, so we are all still learning in as far as what have these you know, vaccines you know, done in as far as the future of humanity. Because all of a sudden, you know, we are getting young people who normally would not present with certain conditions. You know, like uh, a lot of young people are getting these, what, what we call, you know, cardiomyopathies, coming in with clots and <clears throat> so on. And yes, it was well documented that these vaccines will will induce a response in the body, which will end up generating antibodies and so on, which will protect the individual from getting the infection. But unfortunately, that response will vary in different individuals. So we've had situations where for a very young people, you know, they were getting the first dose of the vaccine, but when they got the second dose of the, of the vaccines, because of the robustness in that second you know, immune response, they would end up running into trouble. That's why you, you, you will see how the vaccines were deployed. It was initially you know, the over 70s, 60s, you know, coming down like that. When we got to the young generation, the, the, the teens in some countries, they even didn't, you know, start deploying those vaccines. But the good thing is that the the vaccines, I think, achieved what they were meant to do. And what they were meant to do is reduce the number of deaths in the population. And now we are just dealing with some of the consequences of, uh, you know, that vaccination. So yes. You know, people have got issues either from the infection itself or, or side effects from the vaccine. But a lot of the things that have come up and the things that are coming up are things that we can, you know, deal with.
from a medical you know, fraternity perspective. And it's about early identification of you know, symptoms, and it's about you know, being you know, investigated <clears throat> properly and being put onto the right you know, um, therapy, so to say. So, for example, um, you know, there are, there, are, there are people who come in and say to us, all of a sudden I've got a very fast heart rate. Even if I'm sitting down, you know, I've got a very fast heart rate. And it happened after I got vaccinated or it happened after I was, um, you know, I was infected with uh, COVID. And uh, the cardiovascular community, you know, has got treatments for some of those conditions. But um, it's about the individuals identifying that there is a problem and coming up and they get the proper, you know, care, so to say. Mm. Okay, great. Uh, mm. uh, uh, we we <clears throat> just mixing, trying to mix the online and mm. the in mm. the room. Mm. So I'll take the online as the, as the team in the room is sitting up. Brother Sam says, thanks for the great conversation, Doc. Always good to learn from your expertise and experience. A couple of questions, too. What are the regular medical tests men at our ages should be having? One. And then the second one, what are the main drivers of what problems and what can men do or avoid to have younger hearts? That's a very good question. And that's, I think that's a, that's a conversation that we've had uh, a few times in the past where at different stages in your life, there are specific tests that one needs to have. The first one, which is a very simple screening test, is um, monitoring your blood pressure. Unfortunately, in this environment, this is Africa. Africans are predisposed to high blood pressure and its complications. So one needs to go for regular blood pressure checkups. And one of the telltale signs that there might be an issue with blood pressure is, you know, some people have issues with headaches, blood vision, dizziness, you see. And even before getting to those, sim, you know, symptoms, one is to have a conversation with their <laughs> parents, have a conversation with their grandparents to find out what has happened in the past. And danger signs are things like strokes. You'll be told, no, your grandfather died from a stroke. You know? Your, your grandmother had a heart attack or they had kidney failure. Those are complications already of, you know, blood pressure. So just a regular blood pressure checkup is very important. The other thing which is where a lot of guys run into trouble is cholesterol. Yeah, having a regular cholesterol checkup. So when I say regular, at least once a year, guys, we need to just go and have our blood pressure checked. Not only when we are sick, but when we are not sick. The cholesterol, we run into trouble with cholesterol earlier than ladies because of their hormonal, uh, you know, makeup. And part of the problem with cholesterol is our dietary habits. A lot of guys are busy, you know. Guys don't want to cook. <laughs> guys will, you know, come from work, pass through, you know, the takeaway, and, you know, buy. Guys will go to Chisanyama, and <laughs> it's just meat and, you know, so having a, a regular cholesterol check is, is very good. And um, as, we, as we get older, you know, especially when guys start hit, hit, hitting their late 40s, 50s, we also start running into trouble with prostate issues. And there are simple blood tests that can be done on a regular basis just to check 
what is happening when as far as the prostate is concerned. It's no longer, you know, those examinations that the guys used to go through where we used to do, uh, you know, a finger ex you know, examination and someone <laughs> very uncomfortable, you know. There are basic screening tests where you just go and you have a blood test done. Then the other one, which a lot of our teenage guys, I think, need to start testing is things like HIV. Yeah. It's a simple blood test. There's a lot more that we can do these days when it comes to treating HIV. Okay. And then the other... I, th I think more sophisticated testing then, uh, you know, involves around these scopes. You know, I have people come, you know, come to me from other communities where they'll say to me, no, I, have, I haven't had my screening scope, you know, gastroscope and uh, colon scope, you know, because if you look at the literature, what's happening these days a lot of people are running into trouble with uh, cancer of the colon. And it's mainly the men. It's mainly the guys who are running into trouble with uh, cancer of the, <coughs> of the colon. So in such situations, it's coming into hospital and they put a camera up to check what's happening in the, in the stomach. And they put another camera from, from the bottom as well. But they are screening, you know, blood tests sometimes that we, 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 we do for, for, for such individuals. And again, it goes back to the conversations that we're having in our families, you know. I don't, I don't know how many of us in here have had, had con, you know, conversations in our families, in our communities where someone has said, uh, they had colon cancer, you know, or someone died from colon cancer. It's a lot more common these days than it was in the past. So I think from, a, from a, you know, disease, you know, preventative, you know, uh, you know, aspect, those are some of the main, you know, um, <clears throat> tests that we can do from a cardiovascular and cancer prevention, you know, aspect. Then obviously the other things are for your own well-being. You know, the insurance people will talk about BMI, <laughs> you know, before you take out an insurance pro, you know, policy. They want to know what's your weight sometimes. They want to know what's your, what's, what's your height. Because that has got uh, prognostic, you know, uh, uh, um, effect according to their calculations, although they are, you know, there are some of us in here who've got very big you know, body, bodies, you know, very tall, very big, very high BMIs, but it's all muscle, isn't it? And they are very strong. So some of those tests become very subjective you know, in that aspect. But one just needs to keep a regular, you know, uh, eye on your your blood pressure is very, very, very important. I, I don't know how how much you know more I can stress this because I get young guys in their thirties who are coming in with kidney failure because they've had blood pressure from their twenties that was not managed, and when you look in their family. So and so died from a stroke. So and so had kidney failure and so on. But no one, you know, decided to take that young man to a clinic to say, can we have your blood pressure checked? Because this is in our family. This is in our, you know, genes. So those are some, you know, those, those are some of the conversations that we, we, we need to have. Yes. Great. Let's, let's, let's hear uh, Dr. Bar. Uh, th thank you. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation, Doc. And um, you've just been talking about tests and testing, checkups. And uh, um, I want to build up on Brother Sam's uh, question. 
Mm. Um, considering budget constraints that may limit one's ability to afford medical checkups. Oh, I need to take it up. <clears throat> oh, stand up. Oh, <laughs> hey. hey, Brother Langton. <laughs> I think um, they, they want me to compare the height with my son here, <laughs> who is much taller than me now. <laughs> right. Um, I, I wanted to build up on Brother Sam's um, question. Uh, because the doctor has been talking about testing, getting tested, and, and checkups, and, and considering some budget constraints that may limit, uh, that may limit one's ability uh, to afford these medical checkups and, and tests. Um, what types of exercises or sports can one engage in? You know, those things that can help uh, boost the immune system, uh, that can keep us, that can add, help us add some more years to our young lives. Thank you, Doc. Okay. So maybe, maybe let me just bring in Brother Farah's question as well. It's mm -hmm. online, and it's very much online. It's, it's almost the same thing. Since thank you for this message, Doc, I felt as if I was in the diagnosis room with you. My question is, what are the common health issues that men frequent, that men frequently experience that usually go undetected and undiagnosed and how can men proactively? How can men be more proactive in early detection? So, so it, it talks to uh, almost the same thing that uh, uh, Dr. Bora is asking. So, I, th I think for for me, the one big issue that we as men run into trouble with is our mental health. The mental health issues are a big thing, you know, in men, which are undetected. You know, even when you have situations where guys, you know, run into trouble with anger and so on, you know, it was, no, he's just being a man. It's the testosterone and so on. But um, a lot of times it's, it's, um, it's mental health issues. And it's, it's, men, it's mental health that uh, makes us, you know, some sometimes even work too hard <laughs> because that's the only space in your in your life in your in your existence where you find, you know, uh, that fulfillment that I'm the man. You know, I'm providing a solution to a problem. You know, and everything else around you is what is is crumbling, so to say. And um, for, and uh, fortunately, when it comes to some of these, you know, um, tests, you see, it becomes very important, you know, as as men to interact in this environment where you you get a true response or a true, you know, you know, um, counsel. When you interact with your, when you're with your brothers, okay. What do I mean by that? Um, if you are, if you are in these, you know, corporates, you know, everyone is what it's a dog eat dog out there, isn't it? <laughs> so the guys are focused. The guys are driven. You push. You know, guys end up abusing substances. Some people will abuse, you know, alcohol. Some guys are on drugs. Others are on, you know, cannabis, you know. Others end up, you know, having habits, you know, which border on being very promiscuous and so on, you know, just because they need to have that outlet. But in this environment where, you know, the guys can hold each other accountable, for me, that is, you know, a test where, you know, we've had, you know, guys, you know, go, you know, astray in a way. And the guys have said, no, 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 please come. Go and see talk. What's, what's, what's happening? And they come and see me. And I said, no, no, but I can't deal with this, guys. Huh? Let's, you know, go and see so-and-so, go and see pastor so-and-so for counsel and so on. That is, you know, those are some of the tests out there. Now, in terms of um, 
your question where you say it's a lot of, it, it can become very expensive, you see. But the message out there is prevention is better than cure, you know. Pre prevention means the habits that we generate as men from an, from an early, you know, age group. You know, these young boys, they push themselves, they exercise. And then all of a sudden, when they start working, what happens? They don't have time anymore for that. You see? And it's about creating a balance in your life. And yes, we've all walked, you know, that journey where you, you go to school, you get a career, you push in your career, and then... When you're about, when you've made enough money to, you know, to start enjoying life, you are, you are, you are, you are ill and you can't enjoy that money anymore. So it's about creating that balance, you know, for, for me. And also identifying that we are not invincible as men, you know. We are not in, invincible. A lot of times when the guy is running into trouble, if they are in a good relationship with, you know, with, with their wives, they will come with their wife. And I will have the conversation with their wife about the guy. <laughs> <laughs> because what then happens is that he will say, no, I'm fine. And I said, no, 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 you're not fine. On this day you did this, this happened, that happened, that happened. You know? And then you realize that Sometimes it's a mindset thing with the guys. You know that we have to accept that sometimes we cannot be strong all the time. You know, and if we don't take care of ourselves, things can break down and uh, we end up in trouble. And if we have loving, you know, a family, you know, sometimes it's the kids. And uh, some, you know, the kids can be the worst because they'll come from, you know, with a whole list of questions from Google. <laughs> you know, he did this, what does this mean? He did that, what does that mean, you know? And then, <laughs> and then the guys, you know, start apologizing. No, I'm so sorry, you know, it's my daughter, you know, she's very anxious and so on, which is, which is fine. But... The bottom line for, for me is developing that, creating that balance for yourself where you eat well, your regular checks don't have to be very expensive, you know. They become very expensive when the guys are running into trouble. You see? <clears throat> but if you are, you know, exercising regularly, we normally say walk 30 minutes a day if you can walk. If you can run, run <coughs> two to three times a week. Eat well. A lot of us run into trouble from the diet. The diet is, is the biggest killer out there. We, we went through a, an experiment. I'll call it an experiment, you know, in my, in, in, in my own family where one of our childs, you know, one of our kids was not doing very well nutritionally. And... You know, we were feeding this child, you know, all of this fruit from one of these well-known, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, purees and so on. You know, my wife would just walk into the shop and say, no, my son, you know, enjoys this fruit and that fruit. It's already prepared. So we went through, a, through an experiment where, you know, we, we, we ran tests in this child. And, you know, the, the normal tests were coming out fine. And then we went through a process where we are now looking at what he's passing out of his gut. And we sent it off somewhere. They ran some very, you know, complicated analysis of what he's lacking from a micronutrient perspective. And then they picked up, no, 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 no. He's, he's, he's lacking these micronutrients. And then we got, you know, a script for very expensive, you know, micronutrient replacement. And then I sat back and I said to myself, but you know what?
this this child, you know, is being fed a lot of fruit, a lot of purees and whatnot from, you know, all of this. And uh, only to realize that we've got a problem in as far as our nutrition is concerned in this, you know, not only here, but I think worldwide where there is a lot of fruit out there, there is a lot of food out there, but the actual nutritional value is not what it's supposed to be. Which I suppose creates an industry out there for, you know, for um, replacements, vitamins, and so on. So in, besides eating well, you also have to then supplement with, uh, with all of this. But if you grow your own fruits, if you grow your own vegetables and so on, you will most likely benefit more from a nutritional perspective, so, so, so to say. Which is why, if you look at the food that's exported from some of our countries, it has to pass certain tests, isn't it? And if you look at those tests, it means they haven't added so many other, you know, things to it. It means that food is fully nutritious. So it's about eating well. well. So what am I saying? Going going back to our villages, I think, you know, going back to growing our own vegetables in our own gardens, you know, and uh, feeding off the natural nutrients from, you know, from the soil. A lot of the food that we are eat, eating these days is 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 grown in where? Yeah? It's grown in uh, in water, you know, that has got fertilizer flowing through it, and the plant is hanging there, and it just sucks out the you know the whatever nutrients that it requires, and the fruit is formed, and you know that's mm -hmm. it. That's that's where the the world is growing. So if you have an opportunity, I know some of us here are farmers, you know to grow our own. So that is, so that's the way to go. So exercise, eat well, regular checks before they become too expensive. Okay. Yeah. Talk, <laughs> that's, 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 uh, that's, that's heavy. Um, questions are starting to flow. Yeah. I'm going to take about, try to combine two here before we, we take the questions from the floor. Uh, a comment from Brother Amen says, thank you so much for, for your approach to share practical parts that I did not consider when thinking about wellness. Then the two questions that I'll take is, one, Brother Good says, how regular should we have a colon check? And then, Tafas or Sosko, oh, I don't know this, Tafas or Sosko, or oh, it's mm. Brother Lantern sometimes, it must be what I think. Uh, he says, thank you, Dr. Farai. Could you kindly elaborate, elaborate on the injectables you mentioned? As men kindly advise as preachers how we can remain relevant in our bedrooms with the rise of so many enhancers for both men and women. That was coming. <laughs> 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 That's you. <laughs> okay. So I think I think the first one is, you know, the colon checks. A lot of times from the age of 50, a lot of guys have a basic screening test. And then if there are issues identified there, they'll say to you, come back after five years or come back next year. Or they will remove, uh, uh, you know, what, what we call polyps you know, and uh, take them for, uh, for testing to see if there's any malignancy or pre-malignant, you know, change there and then take it from there. So generally from, you know, from about 50, it is advisable, it's, you know, to, to, to just do, do that. But prior to that, if you are an, an individual who has a lot of issues with <clears throat> gas, you know, constipation, heartburn, then it might be, you know, advisable to start having some of those, you know, checks done before. Okay. And then some of the, um, the injectables or enhancers, there's a lot of medication out there which helps, you know, people lose weight, which is the one thing that, you know, a lot of people are, you know, going on about. People are now more worried about how they look 
You know, gone are the days when, you know, when you made money, you made a statement by, you know, <laughs> <laughs> by, <laughs> by having the biggest tummy in the room, you know. <laughs> you see? So, I mean, these days, you know, guys are coming for um, injectables to help them lose weight, you know. Guys are having, um, you know, bypasses. Uh, you know, gastric bypasses, gastric, you know, these are, you know, procedures that shrink the, the capacity of the stomach essentially, uh, such, you know, such that you reduce the amount of food that you are taking. And uh, because you are reducing the amount of food that you are taking, you are not going to, you know, gain all of that weight, you see. So guys, you know, guys are coming for that. And a lot of celebrities, eh, where you find they will, they will post videos, you know, for these young, you know, young, young ones in the gym doing all sorts of things. Eh? And they say to you, if you want to stay in shape like this, this is what you need to do. And yet, in the middle of the night, they are coming to us to say, you know, help, Baba. I need uh, a balloon, you know, put in my stomach. And you put a balloon, they, it reduces the capacity of, of, of the stomach, and they, you know, and they are losing weight. So there are a lot of these gimmicks out there, you see? But the bottom line is that, you know, we, as men, we need to take care of ourselves, and we need to do it in the natural way. And that's eating well. And unfortunately, a lot of us run into the trap where, you know, you, you are in your, your fit in your 20s, eh? and so you're strong and so on, you get married. Then you start, you know, putting on weight. If you're not putting on weight, then, you know, the families, they are in, in the African context, they say, ah, no, you know, this, your wife is not taking care of you. <laughs> And the women also, unfortunately, you know, get upset when you walk home and you find, ah, there's a big, you know, there's a big spread eh, of uh, meat and whatnot, and you just nibble and you take a little bit. Who is feeding me? <laughs> <laughs> but that is a trap in a way, I think. Because for them, they will be having all of these diets where they're eating a leaf of spinach, they drink a glass of, you know, uh, lemon water and so on, and that's it. But you, when you come home, you've got this very widespread, isn't it? <laughs> and you must finish that. So it's, it's not falling into that trap and uh, saying to yourself, I'm going to exercise if I need help. There are a lot of guys who, who, who need help with tablets. We need help with injectables to help them lose weight so that they lose the weight and then they maintain it naturally with a good diet, exercise. When it comes to the bedroom, well, there is a lot of stuff out there these days. But it has to be safe, you know, because guys, some, some guys run into trouble where they are not healthy, they use some of these, uh, you know, sub supplements, and they run into trouble. Guys have heart attacks, you know, and um, but that is also, uh, you know, a critical area in in most men's uh, you know lives because uh, that is where we have been, you know, conditioned, you know, to say I'm a man because I can, you know, I can do this. And there's pressure as well from the women sometimes to say, but why are you, why is it not, not, not happening? You know? And yet there is a lot more that we can do in that area from medications, from procedures, but it also boils down to wellness, not only physical wellness, but also the relationship that you have with your partner. You see, and having that clear communication around it, you know, because uh, 
if there is a lot of performance anxiety, then it's not, it's not going to happen. And if the partner is, you know, putting pressure, you see, it's not going to happen. And if you are coming home tired every day because you are working very hard to, you know, to, to maintain this, uh, this lifestyle, it's not going to happen. And if you are abusing or using a lot of these, you know, uh, drugs and alcohol and so on, it's definitely not going to happen. <clears throat> Okay. So if the guys need help, there is a lot that we can do these, these days with medications, with procedures, to an extent where I've had situations where someone walks into me, you know, this, this is something that I've shared before and I'll share it again, where I was still very young in my career and I had my elderly gentleman walking, he says, ah, Baba, you know, he, he says to me, it's not happening. He says, yes, it's not happening. Eh? So I said, okay, examine him, it's fine. Scripted some medication. A week down the line, he walks, the wife walks in. <laughs> <laughs> and he follows, you know. And she says to me, what did you get to this part? <laughs> <laughs> he says, don't, you see. So all, I, so all I'm saying to you, <laughs> so all I'm saying to you is that there is a lot more that we can do for, you know, for, for men out there. Okay. <laughs> there. <laughs> Okay, let's 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 take uh, maybe if there are two questions, we take probably two questions. Yeah. This one, just watching the clock. Go okay, no. Uh, morning, uh, once again. Uh, thank you, uh, Doctor Dube, for such uh, insightful insights. Uh, my, my, I, I want to dwell more on the supplements, right? I liked mm -hmm. it. You touched on how it has affected, especially the young ones coming through high school. You know, growing up, you know. You had certain of the high schools, the former group A schools in Zim, you know, the youngsters perhaps being exposed to these supplements and the like. And um, I think you have been kind of dwelling on it. And when you touched on the supplements, you kind of mentioned the word healthy. I, I wanted to uh, find out whether you could want to maybe dwell more on that, especially the issue of supplements and how they potentially can affect the well-being of uh, those who consume them. Um, okay, I think that's a that's a very good question because we we encounter a lot of young people who are, you know, at the prime in terms of their um, athletic, you know, abilities, and it's their in their minds, you know, they you know they've been told you need to take this protein, you need to take that, and so on and so on. And unfortunately, a lot of these kids are vulnerable to, to an extent where it can go beyond the, the proteins or the, the, the vitamins and so on, where they are given this image that for you to have this muscle, this strong, so and so is has been using this type of protein and this type of you know supplement and there have been cases where they end up overdosing on some of these things to an extent where it can affect their kidneys <laughs> to an extent where if they start using steroids they run into trouble a lot of trouble, trouble from uh, even you know erectile dy dysfunction from a very very young age, and unfortunately, some of these hormones or hormone preparations also affect the shape of their bodies. You know, it's not only this. You know, they become very strong and so on, but. They, uh, they, they, they have 
some end up with you know breasts or some become feminized in a way because of the type of hormone preparations that they end up taking and uh, some become very angry individuals yeah because they end up taking a lot of testosterone and so on where the anger if you if if you work in some of these you know you know gyms you know you will find out that the the guys that are always they are very short tempered eh? in <laughs> And then you say to yourself, but what is going on here? And if you look, you will then realize some of them, because they go through this, these cycles where they have to prepare for competition and so on, they've got routines. I've had situations, you know, to meet some of them because they end up coming in with a heart attack or something like that. And then they'll say to you, no, I'm preparing for this competition. So I've got this routine and I eat, you know, so much, you know, protein and so on. And I have this injectables that I take. And it's during those periods where they are taking those injectables, they can get heart attacks, they can get kidney failure, they get... Um, the, you know, the palpitations and strokes and so on. What else is available out there is the normal, you know, vitamin supplements, which unfortunately, <laughs> we sometimes call it, this is expensive urine, but... <laughs> <laughs> This is expensive urine that you know people end up producing when they take these supplements because a lot of them cannot be you know processed by the body or the body does not you know take them out of the gut. So you'll be given a handful of these things, eh? but your your body will only absorb a very small amount, and the rest of it just is just washed out of your body. So one needs to then sit down with you know a professional to say how much of what do I need and what is a good quality supplement because a lot of the sub supplements out there <laughs> a lot of the supplements out there uh, you know people end up producing what we 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 call you know expensive urine so. People must just eat well, eat a you know a balanced diet at the end of the day. Mm. Because that can be very expensive, you know. I mean, imagine spending 900 rand, you know, a month on one, you know, vitamin. And some people are taking five, six of those things in the morning before they leave the house, and it just goes in and out. Please. Hectic. Okay, mm. we are down to our last five minutes. Mm. I still want to quickly show this question and see if we can we mm. quickly take it. Before. Thank you, Dr. Jube. Um, my question is, I enjoyed the discussion today, so what practical steps are you thinking to take? Because charity begins at home. Or <clears throat> they say a prophet is no honor in his own, but I think we have got a lot of honor from what you have said. So what practical steps are you thinking taking say within the men's Christian ministry to implement some of these things are you thinking of like having a wellness day or how can men within have access to this help in a in a sustainable way yeah thank you yeah 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 Doc, I, I, I think that. okay <laughs> Should I face that way? Or? Yeah. <laughs> I just want to find out. Um, I'm coming from the other end. Jesus says, when you fast. So in other words, fasting is something that's critical in the mind of the creator. What are the health benefits of fasting? Okay. When, okay. I think uh, when you fast, fasting has got very... It has got a lot of health 
benefits in individuals. This is the realization. You know, people who, who go through this intermittent, you know, fasting um, way of, you know, dieting or, or, or eating, they derive a lot of benefits in that it programs the system more, more or less to what nature or when God created us, meant us, you know, to eat in that manner. Where if you look at what has happened over, uh, you know, the centuries, we started off as uh, individuals who were what with hunters and gatherers and so on. So you, so you'd only eat, you know, at specific times when you have had the opportunity to go out and gather your food, and you come and you have, you know, a single meal, or you know, and mass, and most of the time the body was, you know, fasting, and we then evolved to a you know to a society where eating you know becomes uh, programmed in your psyche because of cultural you know norms where it's morning afternoon and evening and if you miss a meal you you know you start feeling a bit shaky and so on but the guys who have studied the way the body metabolizes, you know, these, these nutrients and, um, and, and the effect it has even on your, on, your, on your psyche and your emotional, you know, being and so on, have, uh, you know, realized that if we naturally need to fast for certain periods in our times, in our in our lives for instance some some you know nutritionists or dietitians will say to you don't have a meal beyond seven o'clock at night because you need to have that evening you know fasting period okay and then you can only start having a meal from the morning during the day but you will always have to have that fast so there is a move around intermittent fasting, and people have seen a lot of benefits from, from it. You know, people have lost weight, people's, um, how can I put it, uh, you know, vigor or energy level, you know, levels. I have patients in my practice, you know, who have, uh, you know, we have tried everything else and then they say to me, I'm going to try intermittent fasting. And they go into one of these programs and they come back. A few months down the line, they've lost five kilos. So it works, but it doesn't work for everyone, I think. But I, and, and I also think it is also lifestyle, uh, you know, dependent in that. For some of us, because of the nature of our work, we need to have energy intake right throughout the day. So you need to be eating, you know, you know, a snack there, healthy snack there, and have a meal and a main meal at some, you know, part of the day. So so to say, to sustain you. So it works. And then coming back to the practical steps, I think it's a mindset thing. For me, and as far as the practical steps are concerned, it starts with the mindset. A lot of us think this is not going to affect me, you know. I'm fine, you know. I've got medical aid, I've got money. It's not going to affect me. So the first thing for, for, for me really is, you know, going on from, from, you know, from here, you know, guys reflecting on their own, you know, plans, you know as individuals to say, how am I taking care of myself? How am I taking care of my family? If something is to happen to me right now, what contingencies do I have in place to take care of my, my family going forward, to take care of me, you know, in my incapacitation? And uh, if I was to be in a critical state, what decisions have to be made as far as my life is concerned? 
Okay. So that is the first thing, I think. Mm -hmm. As an individual, as a family, then as a group, you know, we need to interact differently, I think. You know? A lot of us want to watch soccer, isn't it? <laughs> and we watch soccer with what? Yes. It's food, eh? <laughs> <laughs> and we have so much fun. We get so involved in the game, isn't it? But we are sitting in front of a TV and, uh, you know, enjoying the, the, you know, the game. It's about, you know, saying, no, let's, uh, you know, let's go and walk. You know, let's go on a hike somewhere on a Saturday afternoon. And, you know, the guys can talk. Let's, let's go and play, you know, a bit of golf. You know, so have as as part of this ministry. I I don't know. I know he plays blast, you know, basketball. <laughs> you see, and you know, just gather guys around certain you know sporting activities and create some fellowship around that, and encourage each other. You know, to then um, you know exercise in those specific, you know, areas. But also, I think we also need to bring our bosses on board. Eh? The reason why I'm saying our bosses on board is because the decision of what you eat and what you are today sometimes is not in your hands, isn't it? Yes. It's made by your, you know, your partner, your spouse, when they walk into Woolworths and wherever, when they start, you know, buying that food. So it's, you know, maybe, you know, bringing a dietitian, you know, at some stage to, you know, to give us an idea of what is healthy, you know, what is not, you know, healthy eating. You see? So it is, it is practical things like, like that, which I think will help us as a ministry, not only to grow in, uh, you know, in our Christian faith and belief and, and so on, but also to live longer as, you know, individuals, so to say. Okay. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. uh, that's quite a, a nice uh, ending note. And uh, I, do, I do think that uh, some of these things, uh, the likes of Brother Swatsko, Brother Munya, the other guys, mm -hmm. leadership will take. I think it's easy to bring a dietitian. Uh, mm -hmm. Organizing a health day, that's, that's quite a good idea. I think we should... We should think about it. Mm. But we are, uh, we've overrun our for short our time by just about four or so minutes. Dr. Tube, thank you so much. Uh, mm. It's very difficult to get this kind of information for free. And, uh, and as your patient, I know it's also not easy to get it from you, a kind of like. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so, thank you so much. Really appreciate We don't take this for granted. And uh, may God uh, richly bless you for your. For your kindness for for availing yourself um, into to, to minister to the men on this platform allow me to end by a word of prayer thank you master we thank you this morning we glorify your name we thank you for the time that you have afforded us to learn from your son we pray that you remember him you increase him you bless his family we pray that um even as he's taught us these things you also help him you talk to him you also help him to live even the things that you have taught us master we pray that you bless him continue increasing him continue teaching him um, not only in um, his, um, his career and profession, but also in your word and all the other worldly wisdom that we will benefit from as, as he gathers that information. I pray for each and every man online, each and every man who is in the room. We pray that um, you bless them, you remember them, and you increase them. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Right, gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.